Okay, I think now since it is already three, so we can formally begin. Yes. So uh, welcome everyone to this afternoon session of the first day of QIQT 2023. In this session, we have two speakers. And first speaker is Professor Vladko Vedral. And on a meeting on quantum information, et cetera, I think everybody knows him, but for the sake of uh, fresh students, I'll just briefly introduce him. So uh, Vladko from 2004 to 2009, he was a centenary Recording professor. in progress. Uh, he was a centenary professor, professor uh, at University of Leeds. Since 2009, he has been in a superposition of being a professor at University of Oxford and Center for Quantum Technology at uh, National University of Singapore. And I think if my classical information is correct, since last year that superposition has collapsed onto the Oxford University. So presently he is at Oxford University. Thank you uh, very much. Yes. Uh, so. So he has done seminal work on uh, quantum entanglement and uh, more prominently on quantum entanglement in many body systems and various other kinds of work, which I don't have time to list out right now. Of late, he has been also writing some provocative stuff like uh, <laughs> <laughs> Like everything is a quantum wave interpretation of quantum. <laughs> so I urge you to people to read that also. So the title of this talk is Using Quantum Information Tricks to Detect Ghosts. Thank you. So, uh, thank you very much. Yeah, the so stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Tavish. It's, it's a very kind introduction. Um, I will actually, um, I'm very happy and uh, grateful to be invited. And I would like to use exactly uh, all the tricks of the trade that you mentioned in quantum information. Ultimately, of course, it's all about entanglement, as we know from, uh, from Schrodinger. But I want to revisit um, what we call the static interaction um, in, in field theory. Um, and like I said, the, the tricks, if I summarize the talk, really, um, it, it's, it's, the idea is, is, uh, is very brief, um, that... Um, Trick number one that we learned really is to convert what we might call a global phase in quantum mechanics into a local phase. And then, of course, the fact that quantum systems obey what we call local tomography, which means that even if you have an entangled pair of uh, systems, you can always um, measure locally of course, with an ensemble of systems and estimate fully the state. You don't need to perform any global measurements. Um, so I, I, I will emphasize this as I go along, but this fact that you can convert a global phase, you know, when, when people say you have indistinguishable identical particles, you have two fermions, you swap them and you get a minus sign. And then usually you read that that minus sign is undetectable because um, it's a global phase. However, if you do this in a controlled way, as we do in quantum information, if you have a qubit in a superposition of zero and one, if it's in the state zero, you don't do anything. If it's in the state one, you swap two fermions. Then what we call the global phase before suddenly becomes a relative phase between the states zero and one, and we can detect it. Um, it affects the interference um, uh, pattern of the qubit. And so this is something, this is a point that's frequently missed uh, by people who work in other fields. Um, uh, in, in particular, even many body physicists or um, uh, field theorists, which is relevant for this talk. So I'm gonna focus on the electromagnetic field, uh, but like I said, any static interaction, as we understand it now in quantum mechanics is really mediated by some field or other. Um, and the question is, how should this be understood? Um, and I want to tell you that even in, at this level, we can, in fact, um, test things. That, that's what's exciting to, um, to a physicist like myself, that, in fact, what we are really doing is testing quantum mechanics um, 
uh, in a deeper and deeper way, not just going into the macro domain, of course, this is what people are doing, but we are even revisiting some of the things that we think are um, understood, have been understood, but actually when you revisit it again with these new tools, you, you realize that there is more to say there. So whenever we are doing any kind of um, treatment of interaction, you know that you want a number of principles to be satisfied, of course. So there is the Lorentz covariance, there is the locality of interactions, and there is the gauge invariance. That's the one actually that I want to focus on because it seems to me that there is more uh, to say about gauge invariance than, um, than what we frequently read about in, in textbooks. So if you apply this to the electromagnetic interaction, you know that a charge is described by this four current and of course, the electromagnetic field then has to be described by the four uh, vector potential, as we call it. And that's because, of course, product of two such four vectors, um, if, if it's constructed in this way, is, of course, relativistically um, invariant. So that automatically satisfies uh, the condition number one. Locality of interaction is automatically satisfied as well, because what we mean by that really here is that um, the current couples to the vector potential point by point. They only couple at the point X. Of course, this quantity now has to be integrated over the whole space. And that's where you realize then that, that the gauge invariance is satisfied too, because if you change this vector potential by a gradient of a function, that thing will go to zero. Um, when you take the integral over space. So you can satisfy all of these things. And again, uh, a standard field theory textbook will, um, will do something like this if you, if you read that. Um, what I like about um, how one ought to proceed from here, and that's exactly the discussion I want to, uh, I want to have, um, is that, that you should really be now writing the vector potential so you can solve the propagation equation. You know, you, you have the usual, um, the usual wave equation that's relativistically com compliant. You have the source, which is the current. And what this says really is that the field at some point x prime uh, simply arises from the current at point x, and then it's propagated in a causal way uh, to that point x prime. Causal simply means that um, it travels between the two um, at the speed of light in this case, but usually no faster than the speed of light. Of course, it could probably propagate at any speed, um, at least in principle. Um, if you now apply the charge conservation, which is written relativistically in this way, I think all of you know that, then of course, uh, you are automatically working in something that we call the Lorentz gauge. This is the Dutch Lorentz. This is not the this is frequently written as with a T, but like the other Lorentz, the Lorentz transformation, but this is not the same person. In fact, this person was uh, much older than, uh, than, um, than Lorentz, um, the Lorentz transformation. So basically the Lorentz gauge as it's known is simply the vanishing of this. And, and in fact, um, if you write this in momentum, in the, in the case space, if you like, um, it immediately, uh, tells you something that, again, you may learn from various textbooks, is that the longitudinal component of the vector potential and the temporal, the zero component, must uh, vanish because k is orthogonal to, to a. If you like, the, in the inner product of k and a is, is zero, which means that only the transverse components um, are the relevant ones is what we conclude uh, usually. So, so um, of course you can take a different approach and that's the approach I want to advocate. And seemingly whenever you read all of these accounts, people say that the two approaches are equivalent. But now I want to, I want to say um, something possibly also controversial um, as Tabish said, maybe, uh, maybe the two are not equivalent to one another. Or maybe we have to rethink, of course, how we um, quantize in, in other gauges, in the Coulomb gauge and so on. I, I can see many possibilities, but what I want to do is offer an experiment 
uh, that could in principle discriminate between some of these possibilities. And at least maybe it forces us to reconsider how we understand this, even if nothing, uh, nothing as dramatic uh, as the breaking of the gauge invariance comes out. But I think it's really worth uh, trying to do this experiment. So the other approach, which is the one I like really, is to quantize all the four modes. I'm thinking of all of them as being physical. Therefore, um, we need to quantize them in quantum mechanics. And that really means that you are quantizing all four modes of the electromagnetic um, potential. But then uh, you still have to impose the above condition, the Lorentz condition, um, and that's it. So you can just simply say, well, I'm not going to ignore the longitudinal and, um, and the temporal mode um, at the very beginning, uh, which would be the Coulomb gauge. I'm actually going to keep all of these modes. I'm going to quantize them all. And then I will look at the subset of states that actually comply with the Lorentz condition. And this is this famous Gupta Bloiler um, uh, method. These are two independent papers. Uh, written on this, I think, in the 50s, uh, which actually say the question now is, of course, um, uh, how do I impose the Lorentz condition quantum mechanically? Um, so that, that would be the most logical way to do it, the, uh, the most coherent way. You really treat everything quantum mechanically, as I said. But then, of course, these vector potentials, A0, A1, A2, and A3, all become operators. They have to all be um, upgraded to quantum mechanical operators. And the question is, how is one to understand this condition that the operator vanishes equals to zero? That sounds a little bit too much in a, in a sense. You know, is, the, is that just a matrix with all the zero entries? It, it's not even clear actually how to interpret the vanishing of an operator um, in this way. Um, and in fact, Gupta and Bloiler said, well, what you need to do is you need to act on this, on, on, a, on a vector um, with this operator, and you need to require that the physical states are only those states where the condition is satisfied, where, where the action of this operator, the gradient of A, acting on the state equals zero. Um, and it simplifies very nicely if you, if you look at it again in momentum space. Um, as you know, things are always nicer like that. It says that the annihilation operator acting on the longitudinal mode minus annihilation on the temporal mode, on the zero mode, acting on the state uh, equals zero. Which actually what it does really uh, physically is it says that when you create excitations in one of these modes, in the, let's say in the temporal mode, you will create an equal number of excitations in the longitudinal mode. And in all of these calculations, when you ultimately, if you keep all of the four modes, the excitations in the two modes for those states that satisfy this condition will always cancel out. They will actually vanish as though they didn't contribute at all um, to, to any physics. And that's the interesting thing. So somehow, even though we are keeping all the four vector potentials, when you apply this condition here, the Lorentz condition is an operator equation acting on the subspace of states giving you zero, all of these states will effectively behave as though you were in the Coulomb gauge. But the point I want to make is that it's not quite like that. And it's not quite like that because um, if you acknowledge that these uh, zero and longitudinal modes are really quantum, they, they have vectors that pertain to themselves and they have operators that characterize them. These modes in particular, it's the zero mode that I will discuss now, the one that's relevant for the static interaction. These modes become entangled to your charges. Um, and, and that's the interesting thing. So if you follow the Lorentz, gauge logic, um, you have to attribute the quantum reality to the zero mode, to the temporal mode. And as soon as you attribute this reality to the temporal mode and the temporal mode couples to charge, that means, as we know from Schrodinger, Schrodinger's cat argument, that means that these modes have got to 
get entangled to the charge. So if I have a charge in a superposition of two different places, then it makes one kind of um, disturbance in the modes in one position, it makes a different disturbance in the modes in a different position. And effectively, you can think of A0 mode getting entangled or making a measurement on the charge, which, as you know, ought to affect the superposition of the charge. And the question is, can we detect this? Is this what's happening, really? Um, for me, again, the interesting thing is that you have nothing like that in the Coulomb gauge. As we understand it, uh, it's not to say that you cannot modify the Coulomb gauge to include what I'm saying. But as we traditionally understand it, in the Coulomb gauge, we have no A0 component. In fact, it's substituted by a Hamiltonian, which looks like a coupling between two different currents. If you have two charges at two different locations, then the charge current, uh, in this case, it's the static, it's the density, charge density at x0 couples directly to charge density at x prime. Um, and the comment I'm making here, the reason why I don't like the Coulomb gauge myself um, is simply that this looks non-local. Uh, remember that I told you that locality in, in, in quantum mechanics is imposed by the interactions being point-wise. The particles can only couple and fields only point by point. You cannot couple one point non-locally to another point. But in the Coulomb gauge, it looks as though we are doing exactly that. Of course, it's not like that because once you do the proper treatment, even the Coulomb gauge is, of course, um, Lorentz uh, covariant gives you the invariant results. But it's very interesting how causality, um, actually, the story is, is much more complicated in the, in, the Coulomb, in the Coulomb gauge. And you have, to, you have to get the transverse modes to send signals that would cancel the non-local contributions when you move one of the charges. And I don't want to go into the details of this. That's the aside that I mentioned here. But it's very interesting that explaining causality fully in the Coulomb gauge is highly non-trivial. But I don't, I'm not even going to particularly care about it. What I'm going to care about is that A0, the temporal component of the vector potential, does not even exist in the Coulomb gauge. It's not an operator. It's simply A0 and AL are taken out of the consideration from the very beginning. And what we do is quantize the transverse modes. And then we add, that's the dynamical part, and then we add the static interaction in this non-local way. And that's your usual um, Hamiltonian in the Coulomb gauge. So if A0 doesn't exist in Coulomb, it cannot entangle to the charge. There's nothing to entangle there. The mode simply just does not exist. It's not that the quanta of the mode are not observable, as I was claiming in the Lorentz gauge. These things don't even exist in the first place. There's nothing to observe. And surely, if you tell me that in one gauge, I have entanglement between the charge and the field, and in another gauge, I don't, this ought to be um, tested experimentally, and we will get the result one way or the other. And that's exactly what I what I would like to uh, what I would like to tell you about. So let me tell you how the static interaction works in the Lorentz gauge. Of course, in the Lorentz gauge, like I said, everything is really dynamical. So if you have two charges at, at x, one is at x, and the other one is at x prime, what you really have is um, the equation I wrote before that uh, you could think of it this way even though it's fully symmetric, you can always swap the two charges. Um, what you can think of now is the charge density from X is propagated to X prime, again, propagated in a fully causal way at the speed of light. It generates the vector potential at that point X prime. And then the charge at X prime, remember the interactions are always point, point wise, the charge at X prime couples directly to that generated uh, vector potential A0. So that's how we understand the coupling um, of two charges in the static limit. Notice that, that, that it's all nice and causal from the very beginning. It's manifestly Lorentz invariant because I'm keeping all four uh, components of the vector potential. 
they are all quantum. I've quantized all of them, and they propagate in a in a causal manner, as you can see here. So th th that's kind of the way you would understand um, static interactions in the Lorentz gauge. And now I want to just tell you that sometimes people, when 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 we discuss these things, we go into this very funny language, which which kind of confuses things. Um, I think it, it's historically how people thought about this uh, kind of interaction, which is why the language is still stuck with us, even though uh, probably we should know better. And I think when we teach the new generation of physicists, I think we should avoid these things or at least clarify them. People sometimes say, ah, the way you can understand the static interaction is that there is a virtual photon that somehow travels between these two charges. And I think this is almost certainly wrong because nothing really travels as such. There are no virtual photons as we saw, even from the Lorentz condition. Um, but what does happen, of course, is that the charges couple to one another simply because they've made these disturbances in the local A0 operator. And these disturbances have a non-zero overlap. And basically that's what gives you the coupling between the charges. So these virtual, virtual particles are wrong in the same way, by the way. We keep making the same mistake when we present quantum mechanics. In the same way that when we talk about tunneling, uh, we are saying, oh, a particle is coming from the left. Then somehow there is some kind of virtual particle that propagates through the potential because the energy, um, the energy um, uh, conservation is, of course, uh, violated there. How can, how, can, how can this particle exist there? It has to have some kind of weird energy if you want to go into, into this kind of discussion. And then a real particle pops out at the other end. Of course, that's not at all what happens, actually. And you can, you can analyze tunneling, you can analyze um, Coulomb interaction in a completely uh, normal quantum mechanical way where you never have to talk about any weird particles popping in and out of existence and things like that. So there are no virtual particles, really. I think it's, it's maybe a colorful picture um, when you're describing some kind of perturbative calculation, but I think it's almost certainly wrong. What happens, interestingly enough, is, is exactly what I said before. You have, um, you have your um, electron, let's say, at the position x. It disturbs. These are all the coherent states that pertain to the zeroth mode. And the longitudinal mode, like I said, you can assume for all practical purposes exists in the vacuum state. The longitudinal modes are not relevant here because I'm really going in the limit of static interactions. There is nothing dynamical happening. Now, if you exponentiate the Hamiltonian, only the J0, A0 component contributes to this. And of course, that's exactly what the charge does at, at its own location, it creates a set of coherent states, one in each of these k modes of the zeroth mode of the vector potential. And so you can think of this charge and surrounded by a cloud. Sometimes people say again, cloud of virtual particles, but even this is wrong, really. It's simply a set of coherent states that are generated uh, in the A potential. And when you bring these two charges together, the interaction between, now you have an overlap between these two clouds, if you like, and that's really what gives you the static interaction. And I just want to make an analogy because all of these things are one and the same really in quantum physics. I want to make an analogy with chemistry. So you could understand the Coulomb interaction in exactly the same way that we understand the bonding of two hydrogen atoms into a molecule. So here you would be talking about bonding of two charges or anti-bonding, of course, they, they could repel each other. But you could explain the bonding of two charges by some kind of exchange of virtual particles, even though nothing, of course, gets exchanged here. In the same way that if you have a hydrogen atom and you have another hydrogen ion, we know that the as they get closer and closer to one another, 
the overlap between the respective electronic states gets larger and larger. And the new states, because of this interaction, are different to the old eigenstates. And one of these states has a lower energy than the previous states. And basically, that's, of course, what gives us the quantum mechanical explanation of the hydrogens, uh, hydrogen atoms bonding into a molecule. Um, chemists love to call this resonating valence bond, but nothing is resonating. The, there is no re the, the same way that photons are not hopping between two charges, electrons are not hopping between two atoms at all. In the static regime, you can make an electron hop whichever way you like if you drive it, but that's not basically at the root of understanding uh, this kind of bonding. So it's very interesting. The analogy is exactly there. And by the same mistake that we make, that we say that things are hopping back and forth is made in all of these, um, all of these accounts because they're all one and the same account. Everything is the same in quantum mechanics once you understood it properly. Um, so Coulomb, if you want to write it as a resonating temporal photon bond, it's, it's, the, it's the name I coined to make it uh, look like chemistry as much as possible. This would probably appeal to chemists, is you can write your Hamiltonian in the diagonal basis, then there are these off-diagonal elements that come from the fact that the cloud of the A0 mode around one location is starting to overlap with the cloud from the other location. And that overlap is what gives you the off-diagonal elements. And when you diagonalize this new Hamiltonian, lo and behold, as they say, out comes the Coulomb interaction. That's it. That, that's exactly it. There's always the same explanation for anything uh, in quantum mechanics. All bonds, if you like, are of this, ultimately of this kind. And that's, of course, the beauty of, of unifying them in this way. Uh, so this was just a slight detour to now, finally, I've got about 10 minutes uh, before I uh, should finish, really, to tell you how you might experimentally want to demonstrate that the temporal mode is both real, it's there, and it's quantum. And so, of course, I'm a simpleton physicist, and, and when I say that something is real, I always follow the same strategy as we do in physics, it's not a philosophical question, so to speak, it's a question of whether it can affect um, the charge in the same way that the T modes, the transverse modes do. And it seems to me, from what we've been saying, that you should really think of the temporal mode um, as being as real as any other mode of the electromagnetic field. That's really the, the punchline of this. And I, I will show you how you might want to test this experimentally. Of course, by quantum, it means exactly what Schrodinger would say is quantum mechanical. It has the capacity to entangle itself to other quantum systems. Um, this is something that I think Bryce DeWitt called um, quantum totalitarian property. He, I think he abstracted it from the Schrodinger cat experiment that namely whenever you have a superposition and whenever that superposition couples to something else, then that something else has got to join the superposition. And the same happens to be true for the A0 mode of the electromagnetic field. And that's interesting. Uh, so here is an experiment. You have a test charge on the left at some point X1. And you have another charge that you're going to use now to do the interference. And the charge is, is a very simple experiment, obviously. Um, and in, in fact, in some guises, it's been done many times. Really. But what hasn't been done is what I will propose to you now. That's the second trick from quantum information. So basically, what we do here with the second electron is make it uh, in a superposition of two locations, x2 and x3. And now, obviously, because of linearity, you will get an interaction between x1 and x2, and you will get interaction between x1 and x3. And there will be a relative phase that develops between these two. Incidentally, I'm, I'm making a very brief comment that when we do gates with cold atoms, with ions in ion traps, 
we actually, one way of implementing a controlled knot gate, a controlled phase in this case, is to take two ions, put each in a superposition of two locations, and then let the phase develop precisely because of the electrostatic interaction, that they interact more strongly if they are closer to one another, which means uh, the phase develops more rapidly then. And if you, if you time this properly, you can actually get what we call um, a phase control phase gate, uh, which in a different basis looks like a control not gate actually. So, so you, you can in fact do anything with this kind of interaction. Um, but here, I want to focus on the following thing. Um, the question really is, um, what happens to this temporal mode as you, so I want to give you a word of warning why we need an extra trick from quantum information, which I call local tomography. So if you, here, here is the interference experiment, uh, one possible way of doing the interference experiment with the second electron. You can make it in a superposition of two different states here. And then you can close the interferometer at the end and make a measurement. This is what we would call a Max Zander interferometer. However, as the title indicates, the entanglement between the field, this cloud that I drew in blue, and the electron would not be observable in this way. Some people call this fake entanglement. I think I, I heard this from, from Tony Leggett. Uh, maybe Bill Unruh was the first person to point. I'm, I have no idea. Probably many people are aware of this and they pointed it out at various stages. Um, so why? Because as you make the superposition of the charge and you create this entangled state with the field, when you bring these two back to interfere them, both of these field states also merge back into one and the same state. So they disentangle themselves from the superposition. And we don't want that because then we cannot detect this entanglement here, which is why some people call it fake entanglement. You know, this is not the entanglement that would lead to the reduction of the visibility to decoherence, whatever we traditionally think entanglement does. You can calculate, I'm here calculating the, the amount of entanglement. It happens to be, um, e to the minus fine, fine structure constant on that order. And it's very small, actually. It's not an easy, so th there could be a, a practical challenge uh, when it comes to detecting this. But the point, the question I'm asking now is, is the charge really halfway entangled to the field or not? And what I would like to do is not close the interferometer here, make local measurements here and here, and try to, from that, determine the state of the charge in this state. So the key thing is, is what I'm writing on this slide. Make a superposition, but don't undo it, which of course is the easiest thing to do. That's why what I'm proposing is a challenging experiment. Make a superposition, but now make local measurements in order to estimate, do a full state tomography locally in order to estimate this off diagonal element. The element, um, F1 and F2 are the creation and annihilation operators for fermion, in this case, for the electron at point one and point two. And as I'm saying is if it's correct that the electromagnetic zero potential gets entangled to the charge, then your visibility should actually be reduced due to that. It should be smaller than one, if you like. If there is no component of the electron electromagnetic zero uh, vector potential, then your visibility should simply be equal to one in the ideal case, if you did perfect ex experiment here. And your fringes should simply just be function of the angle, whatever is the phase between the two. So it's very small, like I say, but in principle, it is observable. And that to me sounds like a really interesting idea because this experiment would be revisiting something that we thought was fundamentally fully understood but actually it would test whether the way we think of quantizing something is really appropriate or whether we need to quantize ultimately more things than we thought previously need to be quantized. And I think Tavish mentioned that I write provocative papers saying that everything is quantum mechanical. 
uh, and this is exactly one instance. What drives what drives my uh, research interest in, in in all of these cases is really this question of what would happen if you treat everything quantum mechanically. Um, what kind of difference would that make? And like I said, part of this is um, converting global phases into local phases. Of course, if you have two static charges and there is no superposition, then the phase that develops between them is simply a global phase and you can never observe that. That's boring to us. However, if you make one of these charges in a superposition or both of them, then of course you can observe the relative phase that develops between them. Uh, and, and that's interesting to me. So, so let, me, let me go very briefly into, into, uh, into these conclusions and, and allow, um, hopefully there will be some questions and, and I can clarify some of, these, some of these things. So the statement I'm making is that the static interactions require us to quantize all four modes of the electromagnetic field. Um, I don't know if that statement ought to be considered controversial. Maybe not. I think maybe most people would agree that this is, that this is true. The second statement, however, um, could be controversial. It depends really what you conclude from this. So what I'm saying here is that this seems to violate gauge invariance at the quantum level. Why? Because in one gauge, the Lorentz gauge, there are modes that do entangle themselves to the charge and affect the interference fringes. In the other gauges, let's say the Coulomb gauge, there, there are no such modes. They're called ghosts. That's why I use ghosts in my title because, because the, the excitations, as I said, from the two modes that you call ghosts really cancel one another out. But all that says is that you cannot have excitations that behave like real photons. There's nothing that travels like a photon at the speed of light in these modes. But that doesn't mean that they don't have different kind of excitations. And, and the excitations I was using are, are simply the good old coherent states. Um, and in fact, if you treat them like coherent states, then, then they will make a difference. So here I'm really simply raising a question of, um, does this violate Laura, uh, does this violate the, the gauge invariance or that there is another alternative, which I kind of prefer is to say that the, that the, that the A zero vector potential in this case also has a reality as a quantum operator, even in the Coulomb interaction, you should somehow keep it even when you're talking about Coulomb interactions and you should include it into your description. Again, the description will be awfully non-local because now your A potential will not commute with the current operator at a distance. So that's going to be a funny, the reason, that's partly the reason why I don't like the Coulomb interaction because everything looks funnily non-local, even though it's not. However, you could say, well, I'm going to in principle include A0 even in my Coulomb treatment, I have to modify the commutation relations, but I can basically obtain the same result as I do in the Lorentz gauge. And the question is, which one is right? What's the right thing to do here? And like I'm saying, there is an experiment that could actually tell us um, how to do this. Now, of course, there is another possibility, which I didn't consider here at all. I, 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 th th that's a different question. Um, and I think it has been addressed by a number of people and, and none of the experiments so far, and they, and they go into the um, into orders and orders of magnitude of minuteness, actually. So, so you can eliminate this with, with high degree of confidence, is that there are really massive photons in, in these gauges like the longitudinal and the temporal gauge. That's, I don't require that in my treatment at all. In fact, I, I, I say you should treat them seriously even if they are, they are massless. However, there is a possibility, of course, which this is not testing at all, and I don't even know how one would test it given that I think we ruled it out to a, to a high degree uh, of accuracy. And the final comment I will make before I stop is that all of this, what I said, applies... Um, 
to other fields, and in particular, and I'm saying this because probably there will be lots of discussions about this, and certainly Chiara and myself have been interested in this, and many other people, Sugato Bose, in linear gravity. So the way you understand static interaction in gravity is, of course, the same as we understand it in, uh, in electrodynamics. And so the same treatment that I'm advocating here, in fact, Gupta wrote a, a whole paper about how to quantize um, the gravitational, linear gravitational field in the Lorentz gauge. So that exists uh, there too. But the same question would appear there, uh, namely, does your, do your masses, when you superpose them in a gravitational field, do they actually get entangled to some of these modes? And I think the answer, if, of course, our understanding of linear gravity matches um, our understanding of electrodynamics, the answer ought to be yes there. So I think all of these conclusions can be just translated into all other areas of interest. I will stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. We can't hear you, I think, Tavish. Uh, great. Oh, sorry. Uh, Hi, no talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your very thought-provoking talk. So the talk is now open to questions, but let me uh, start by asking question myself. So yes. see, uh, suppose you have a charged particle, which is which goes into a superposition of two locations. Yes. So this cloud of fields which you are imagining. So in your picture, do do these two clouds of these two superpositions do they interact with each other? Yes, I think um, I think that's how I was proposing to understand the the electrostatic interaction. But I think it's more. The proper way of, of saying this is that what happens is some kind of cloud sharing. Because now you really have these two clouds merging into one cloud. So it's, it's, it's exactly the same as I was saying, if you have um, two hydrogen atoms, and as you bring them close together, what happens is that the electrons now get shared. They suddenly are in a superposition of belonging to both of these atoms. And the same thing happens with these virtual, if you like, the, the name I don't like, but let's call them <laughs> virtual photons. They yeah. really get shared by both of these charges in a way, which is what gives you the electrostatic uh, interaction. Okay, so that means if a similar kind of experiment, one is done using a proton, another is done using a neutron, there yes. should be some way of seeing a difference between these two. Yes, I think you're right. Yes, you're right, because one is um, a neutral ch a ch a particle, and I think there should be a difference. I, I recently came across, it's nice that you're mentioning this, because I came across um, experiments in high energy physics, uh, which at high um, speeds scatter, I think, gold, heavy nuclei, which triggers basically all sorts of, um, all sorts of cascade, um, uh, production of particles. And I think ultimately what they do is measure interference between pions. So it occurred to me, I keep talking about electrons because coming from, from kind of atomic uh, and quantum optics uh, style physics, I'm usually thinking of lab-based experiments, but I think you could go into high energy and test this with neutral particles, as you say, versus uh, charged particles. And I think it, 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 there is a wide range of, of experiments I could think of. It's a, it's a very nice point that you made. Okay, the other thing is that um, a similar idea has been invoked for gravity for gravity by Penrose. Yes. But here uh, you would know that uh, having this kind of um, picture where if you have a superposition of two parts and these two parts also interact with each other, this leads to nonlinearity in the- Yeah, that's equation. true. I, I, I don't need that in my treatment. You are right. I think 
for Roger, what he needs is that um, the entanglement that I call fake entanglement, because if you reinterfere this mass, this entanglement disappears. I think what he requires is that it really becomes real and it really leads to a collapse, as you said. Um, otherwise, otherwise, it's yeah. no different to uh, to just linear gravity. Yeah, yeah, it's a good point. Okay. 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 Thank you. So, anybody else? Uh, may I ask? Uh, yeah, yes, yes, uh, Hello. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Uh, uh, hi. Raymond here. Uh, would like to check. We can we use the Dirac equation? Uh, inter with the interaction with photon, and then we extend to many many electron case. Uh, and see how it turns out. Uh, that means the without quantizing the electrostatic field yet. Uh, yes, yes, good point actually. That um, I even didn't need the Dirac uh, equation here because um, uh, these charges are static, and and um, uh, I, I don't think you need to go the full relativistic treatment. But I think what you mentioned, what I would find very interesting, is how this scales with the number of electrons. Because if the claim is that every electron gets even a little bit entangled to the underlying field, then maybe the state of many of these charges is ultimately not as entangled as we think could maximally be entangled. So I think that's a very interesting uh, idea to go into the larger, rather than doing two charges, why not do a large number of charges um, and see whether, whether we could actually detect a bigger difference uh, because of this entanglement. I think that's a very nice point. I don't, I still don't think you, you would need the Dirac um, equation at all. I mean, of course you can do it with the Dirac equation, but, but you are already in the non-relativistic limit. Uh, thank, thank you. We have published recently the uh, paper, the, the solution, uh, exact solution for single electron with, with uh, interacting with a photon but maybe oh, that's very nice. extended yes. many many electron i can send to you the paper that would be very nice that would be very yeah. nice yes okay. thank you yeah. thank, thank you thank you so deepankar please go ahead with your question yes so Vladko, thanks for the very stimulating talk as usual with you okay. so now, can you go back to the slide about with the fake and en entanglement where uh, you have yes, the visibility? Yeah, yeah. 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 No, yeah. where the visibility expression. So, can you explain that this visibility when you said you calculated the amount of entanglement and then this visit because this is a crucial point the reduction of the visibility. So, can you yes um, it out a bit because yes. Yes, yeah, so how uh, did all, you calculate? I yeah. think all I was doing is I took the Hamiltonian that I wrote down. So namely whether whether J0, where the density, charge density couples to A0. Yeah. And then I calculated the amount um, of entanglement that this generates between the charge in two locations and the field that, that, so, that so that is, when you mean calculating the amount of entanglement, that is what I'm Ah, good question. About, yes, uh, yes. That how do you right, be, right? Be, uh, be yes, good, yeah. good, good, very good point. Yeah, sorry, I was, I'm going very quickly through all of these things, and I think each of these should, um, you are right, should be carefully expanded. The the states, these coherent states, are not orthogonal to one another. Yes, yes. So that's the crucial point. They have yes. a very large overlap, uh -huh. uh, and in in fact, it's exactly this overlap that you need to calculate. So the state is not um, like a Bell state, you know, zero, yes, zero. Yes, plus uh, one, uh, I was worrying about precisely this point. That's exactly right. The state is zero, alpha, zero, let's say, plus one, alpha, one, where alpha, one and alpha, zero, I mm -hmm. think I call them alpha, two and alpha, three here, mm -hmm. are basically um, almost, um, um, almost identical, but not quite. And I yes. think that's the difference that, yes. that I have to, that's it, that's it. So, so you have to take into account that. that That's it. That's it. And it's exactly roughly to the first order one minus the fine structure constant. Uh, yes. Um, 
which is a small number. Uh, but again, given that, um, that in quantum uh, computation, we are improving uh, the fidelity of qubits, I'm kind of hopeful that, uh, that one day someone could achieve this kind of efficiency. So, and also that slide where you displayed the Gupta blood yes. condition, there yes. you made a remark. That's it. Aha, aha, that's right. Now, this condition is crucial. So, here yes. you, you remark subset of shy. So, what that subset? You made a statement, I think. Yes, the subset is exactly the subset where the number of excitations um, in the two uh, modes is identical. So it's a bit like uh, like a two mode squeeze state, you know, zero, zero plus so, one, so, plus so, two. The, so this specification that defined this way, subset and defining yes. this condition is ad hoc, in a sense ad hoc or? Uh, it there... follows, it's it's ad hoc uh, in, in a way that it is our interpretation of the Lorentz condition. So I think it all comes from the fact uh, how we should interpret uh, the fact that um, this gradient of the vector potential vanishes, but now vector potential being an operator. Mm. Uh, one way to do it, which turns out to be too strong as well, uh, is to require that the expected value of this quantity vanishes. Mm. Uh, mm. But actually, you don't need to do that. And I think that was the realization of, of uh, Gupta, that, that it's enough to request okay. uh, that this acting on, on, on the physical, what you would call physical states, vanishes. That what, that's what defines the physical subspace, if you like. Right. So, so this condition is sufficient to guarantee. That's it. You don't need that's it. more than But you are absolutely right that you could, you could ask, why don't you postulate something else? Hmm. And it's possible. Possible, but this is on, on that ground. That's it. That's it. OK. And also the point about the, the reality you made in terms of the effect on the charge. I like it. <laughs> yeah. so, you know, right. so. Thank you. Thank you. Anyway, anyway, nice hearing your talk and hope to Thanks have you in much. Calcutta sometime. I would love to, like I said last time. I really yeah. would love to. We can yes. plan something for the yes. for the next year, maybe. That yes. would be yes. great. Exactly. Thank you. Anyone else, please? We have still time for questions. Okay, if not, uh, Vladko, thank you very much again for thank this you very, much very for talk. Thank you.